Well, he, he was an amazing man, uh, you know, acknowledged by people when he, when he applied to go to Princeton to do a doctorate. The reference he got from one person simply said, this man is a genius. Five simple words. So a, real, a, a radically different mathematician. Most famous for his Nobel Prize winning work in economics, which is in the field of game theory, which we'll get to in a second. But what's fascinating about Nash, someone said of him, uh, um, Jane Austen only wrote six novels, but they were all crackers. Nash didn't do that much work. His mental illness, you know, subsumed a lot of his life. But the difference and variety of fields in which he worked was amazing. Most people think of mathematics as this single block of a subject. When you get to the higher levels of mathematics, they're in different branches. And if you're great at, 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 at group algebra and, and I'm great at, at logical set theory, we, we might not be able to talk at all. Um, Nash made breakthroughs in distinct and separate fields in really deep and hard problems. Some people think the stuff for which he won his Nobel Prize was actually some of the more trivial work that he ever did. Well, we'll get to his work in a moment, but Carl, unfortunately, perhaps he was better well known for his mental illness because of his portrayal in in a beautiful mind. Mm. So it came upon him that he was stricken with schizophrenia, which is not a split personality, but rather an inability to be oriented in time, space and person. And he began to suffer delusions that stopped him being able to function. So at one stage he was offered the professorship at the University of Chicago and he said, well, look, thank you very much, but next week I'm being inaugurated as the Emperor of Antarctica. He thought he saw messages in, in numbers, in particular in the pages of books, in the random number of a bus going past. He, he, he was subsumed by that for a while, would have moments of clarity over those decades where he would do profoundly good mathematical work. His wife stood beside him, they separated, but she still looked after him. And then his recovery was quite miraculous, because from what I understand, it, it, there wasn't some radical drug treatment or anything. Nothing. He just seemed to break clear. He, he came out of it. So his wife had this brilliant idea, then ex-wife, then remarried again. And she said, look, what you need to do is where, be where people like you exist. And so they made up a position for him at Princeton and he sort of hung around and he'd wander up and down the corridors muttering and he'd be seen writing things on blackboards. But every now and then he'd come good and people would just accept him. And this accepting environment let him gradually come out. And, and, and whilst at this time he was you know, looked on as a, a bit of a weirdo and that sort of stuff, at the same time anyone studying game theory at the time thought of Nash as you know, the demigod of the field. Well, let's get to that mm. uh, and his legacy. And you're speaking of, of economics rather than mathematics, essentially. Mm. How did he get into that? And, and just explain then game theory. He worked in a problem of game theory. Game theory is any time there is a game and a set of rules, how should you best play? What results will happen? Noughts and crosses. You know that if I go in the middle first and I play as well as I can, I can't lose. That's the mathematics of noughts and crosses. Game theory had got to a simplistic point before Nash where people thought... Well, if I win, Carl must lose. It's a zero-sum game, two competitors. Nash broadened both to more than two players in a game, but also came to the understanding that you can have a situation where everyone wins, or you can be in a situation where I can't do any better by changing my own strategy unless other people change with me. The great scene in the film is a beautiful woman walks into a bar with a few of her friends. All these guys think, I'm going to make a play for the beautiful woman. Nash realises if we do that, she will brush all of us. Her friends won't want to be second choice, they will brush all of us. If we agree on a strategy to ignore the beautiful woman and all talk to her lovely friends, we'll all get to have a dance with someone. There's a group interest here as well, not just naked self-interest. Now that's not strictly Nash equilibrium, but it's the idea that things can be more subtle than just rapaciously chasing your own self-interest and nothing else. And but this, isn't, isn't yeah. there an assumption that um, humans uh, act rationally then? There's assumptions on that. There's assumptions on how much information you have access to. But Nash equilibrium has underpinned all game theory and incredibly diverse areas like if a government's trying to sell off radio spectrum, if you're conducting uh, disarmament talks between countries, if you're trying to negotiate a peace settlement, if you're trying to work out how many shops to open up in a certain area, one of the most powerful observations in economics in the last 50 years. But can we say then that he came up with a mathematic explanation for human behaviour? in economics. A specific subset of human behaviour when everybody's trying to act in their own best interest and they know that there's a bigger game plan and it's not a zero-sum game where you can actually all do well. And the thing is now that that sort of Nash equilibrium is being explored in evolutionary biology, it's being explored in all different areas of interaction 
beyond what it was originally conceived for. As a mathematician yourself, can you begin to explain his mind, how it worked? No, no there's, 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 I'm, in a, in a room of randomly selected people, I'm a maths genius. In a room of maths PhDs, I'm as dumb as a box full of spoons. There are people like Nash who operate in a field that even other brilliant mathematicians were in awe of his ability, in particular at solving problems in what seemed to be completely distinct fields across his life. And people would even look at his solutions to problems and go, some would even say, I just don't, I don't understand what you're saying. It's so deep and so profound, a once-in-a-generation a once mind. Dr Carl, Dr Adam, thanks Dr. so much. Andrew. Always a pleasure.